Hey there, all you Playbill files. Welcome to Broadway by Ghostlight. I'm Mark Bonani, and this week I thought we'd explore an also ran from the mid 1960s, the musical I Had a Ball. I Had a Ball opened on December 15, 1964, at the Martin Beck Theater, now named the Al Hirschfeld Theater, where Moulin Rouge will hopefully be opening up again soon in the not too distant future. Oh God, I hope so. The musical was the idea of producer Joseph Kipnis, who had produced the musicals High Button Shoes and La Plume de Montante. He would go on to produce several more Broadway productions, some hits like Applause, Seesaw, and I Love My Wife, and some epic flops like La Grosse Valise, Rock by Hamlet, and One Night Stand, which, true to its name, lasted only one night. Oof. Kipnis hired director Lloyd Richards, who would go on to lead Yale Repertory Theatre and be a frequent collaborator of playwright August Wilson, directing many of his plays. Richard was replaced, however, during the Detroit out-of-town tryout by John Allen after Richards and Kipnis had a big blowout, but Lloyd Richards did maintain the directorial credit in the playbill. Good for you, Lloyd! Choreography was by the wonderful Anna White. The score for the musical was by relative unknowns Jack Lawrence and Stan Freeman. Jack Lawrence had had success in the pop world, having written the English lyrics to Beyond the Sea, Bobby Darin's signature song, as well as songs for the likes of Frank Sinatra and Rosemary Clooney. He also wrote the lyrics to the Disney songs Never Smile at a Crocodile from Peter Pan and Once Upon a Dream from Sleeping Beauty. On Broadway, however, he was not as prolific. Failure, 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 failure. He had written the lyrics for the musical Court in Time, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. No? No one? Really? Okay. Anyway, Lawrence's collaborator for I Had a Ball was Stan Freeman, who was making his Broadway debut with this show. He would not enjoy much success on The Great Bright Way either, going on to co-write the score for the short-lived Lovely Ladies, Kind Gentlemen in 1970. The book for the musical was written by Jerome Chodorov, who had written one of my favorite old comedies turned films in the 1940s, My Sister Eileen, which he then adapted for the musical based on it, Wonderful Town, in 1953. One of my favorite shows and definitely an underappreciated musical, in my humble opinion. You're welcome. I Had a Ball had a great cast. The show was a star vehicle for nightclub comedian and beloved character actor Buddy Hackett. Hackett is probably best known today for the Herbie the Love Bug movies, as well as the voice of Scuttle from Disney's The Little Mermaid. It's a dingle hopper. He also, of course, starred as Marcellus Washburn in the film version of The Music Man. Hackett was not too keen on Broadway, though. Ever since the last show he was a part of, a play called Viva Madison Avenue, closed after only two performances, and he really had no interest in doing a musical. Sorry, boys. I don't sing. But he felt he owed it to his friend Joe Kipnis, the producer, who was a big champion for Hackett early in his career. The musical also starred one of the leading men of Broadway's golden age, Richard Kiley, as well as powerhouses Karen Morrow and Luba Lisa. So let's dive in and break down the plot of this musical, shall we? Now listen carefully, here's the plot. After the overture, the stage and aisles of the theater burst to life. It's the 4th of July and we are on the boardwalk at Coney Island. As all the tourists, beachgoers, and other riffraff bustle about, our star comes center stage and freezes the action. He then speaks directly to the audience. Coney Island. A lot of strange things happen in Coney Island, and I am one of them. My name is Garside. Garside the Great, and I have a tale to tell. Afterwards, everyone unfreezes and they all sing Coney Island, USA. We then meet the eccentric bunch of lovable, seedy, carny types that work the boardwalk known as the Alley Gang. 
There's Gimlet, who operates the Tunnel of Love, Osaka, a pretty cringy Asian stereotype, who runs the shooting gallery, Ma Maloney, who runs a food stand serving pizza, knishes, franks, and beer, and Joe the Muzzler, who runs the Belly Rama belly dancing place, where a girl named Morocco works. Morocco played herself, according to the playbill. As the gang starts hawking their goods, Stan the Spieler, played by Richard Kiley, enters. The gang are all happy to see their charming con man friend again and ask him what this year's grift will be. I like grifting. Stan shows them these little toy dogs attached to a string so you can make it look like it walks. He tries to sell the dogs to the various people on the boardwalk, but no dice. He does, however, give one to a little girl on the house, just so we can see that this grifter has a heart of gold. Heart of gold. Our man Garside sticks his head out the window and tells Stan to come up and see him right away. The gang all tell Stan he better do it because Garside's been acting a little strange lately. Strange how? Now in Garside's apartment, he and Stan catch up. We learn that Stan is just getting back from some time at Rikers Island Prison. Garside said it's odd he didn't run into him since he was there in the psych ward until June. Stan asks Garside what his grift will be this year, but Garside claims he's gone totally legit. He shows Stan a large picture of the man who's changed his life, Dr. Sigmund Freud. He explains that while he was in the psych ward, he read 20 volumes of Freud's work. He then handstands a business card that reads Garside the Great Psychologist. Garside explains that he uses analysis, but he throws in a little hocus pocus schmear to really sell it. Give them the old hocus pocus. For $5, you get a character reading plus your zodiac read. For $15, you get a deep analysis plus a bit of phrenology, which is kind of like palm reading, but they read the bumps on your skull. Uh, sir. Phrenology was dismissed as quackery 160 years ago. But if you want to know the future, Garside says, it's 50 bucks. 50 bucks? He then produces a fake crystal ball he's named Sam. Stan, of course, thinks that this is the most harebrained scheme Garside has ever come up with. But Garside said he is serious and tells his friend he'll even give him a free 50 minute hour of psychoanalysis. Stan is reluctant, but Garside begs him to at least let him practice on him as a friend. Stan agrees and lays down on the couch. Garside then basically lays into him. He tells him he's a failure in life because he's too afraid of a challenge, so he hides behind his griffs. Sometimes the truth hurts. We then get a little more exposition and learn that Stan graduated summa cum laude from Cornell University and was once married but got his heart broken. Stan says he likes being free of commitments, but Garside says that someone who's alone is only half of a person. That seems harsh, just saying. Stan does a total 180 and literally says, you know what, you're right. He sings the other half of me. Somewhere there has to be the other half of me, the other half of me. I've yet to meet. Back on the boardwalks as Stan is leaving Garside's, the alley gang are dying to know what Garside's been up to. Before Stan can answer though, Garside sticks his head out the window and puts out a sign for Garside the Great Psychologist and announces he's open for business. He quickly hides the sign however when Officer Milhauser steps onto the boardwalk. And this cop definitely woke up on the wrong side of the bed because he just starts shutting everybody down. Cops are the worst. He slaps summons on Mamaloni's food cart for food poisoning complaints, Osaka for rigging the shooting gallery, Gimlet for allowing unsavory activities to go on at his Tunnel of Love, and Joe the Muzzler for obscenity complaints at his Belly Rama, which he tries to convince the officer is not obscene by having Morocco dance for him. That's not going to work. Luckily for the gang, another of the boardwalk's colorful characters appears, Brooks the Lone Shark, who bribes the officer to tear up the summonses. The officer takes the money, then chases after a streetwalker named Violet, which is definitely a callback to My Sister Eileen slash Wonderful Town, which also features a streetwalker named Violet. You have the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and now there's the Jerome Chodorov Theatrical Universe. You're welcome. No, that's not a thing. After Brooks collects double what he's just bribed the cop from the alley gang, he turns his attention to Garside. 
He tells them that it's collection day and he has to pay up on the hundred dollar he owes him, though Garcia only borrowed four bucks. An interest rate of 10,000 percent. He then literally twists Garcia's arm until he says he'll have the money by 5 p.m. Brooks then looks at the rest of the gang and says that business is a little slow and asks if anyone needs any money. The gang of course say they don't want anything to do with a scammer like him, but Brooks assures them they've got him all wrong and they sing Red-Blooded American Boy, which was not recorded for the original Broadway cast recording. Come on! That makes me so angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Anyway, after that rousing, maybe, number, Brooks leaves as Jeannie, who runs the Ferris wheel, comes on stage. Jeannie was played by the wonderful Karen Morrow. She tells the gang that her hawker quit on her that morning and she's looking for Garside, who used to work for her. The gang tell Jeannie about Garside's new psychological career and an exasperated Jeannie heads upstairs to Garside's. Jeannie has always looked out for Garside and is very skeptical about his new vocation. Seems a little sketchy. He tells her about the trouble with the loan shark and asks to borrow a hundred bucks. She says she'll give him the hundred dollars free and clear if he gives all this nonsense up and comes back to work for her. But Garside says he wants to actually help people, including her, and starts his amateur analysis with her, just as he did with Stan. Now, I am not a professional psychologist, but I am an amateur psychologist. Because this is the 1960s, it gets pretty sexist here, with Garside talking about how frumpy her clothes are, and how you're afraid to let anyone grab your tomatoes, and such things like that. But she, just like Stan, is not interested in love. I'm not at all in love. She reminds him how she's been married before and got her heart broken, which is also like Stan. Yeah, this show had absolutely no room for subtlety. Anyways, she affirms her independence, mostly to convince herself, and sings, I got everything I want. Got a one bedroom flat, got a self-sufficient cat. I'm not sure where I'm going, but I sure know where I'm at. On the shelf, by myself, I'm so happy. Cause I got everything I want. After the number, it suddenly strikes Garside that Stan and Jeannie would be perfect for each other. Garside consults his phony crystal ball and asks it if it sees anyone for Jeannie that is tall, went to Cornell University, and graduated summa cum laude. Jeannie is of course onto his game and knows he must already have someone in mind. But before Garside can try to convince her otherwise, the music suddenly swells and the ball turns bright red. Ooh. Garside starts to panic, because this is definitely not supposed to happen, but to his amazement, he actually begins to see images in the crystal ball. He says he sees Jeannie in a beautiful dress with crushed diamonds in her hair. He says he hears five bells. It's five o'clock and he sees a man approaching Jeannie. But just as the man is about to turn around so Garside can see his face, Jeannie turns on the light and the light in the ball goes out. Hey, I was watching that. Garside is sure of what he saw, but of course Jeannie doesn't believe any of it and leaves. Stan then knocks on the door. He's come to apologize for being curt with him earlier, but Garside is convinced that Sam the Crystal Ball called him there instead. He tells Stan that he thinks he saw him in the ball with his dream girl, but Stan says despite what he said earlier, or I guess saying earlier, he doesn't want a woman in his life. Garside won't give up and tries to show Stan for himself. At Garside's command, the ball does light up bright red again. The same images appear at five o'clock on the boardwalk. Stan actually begins to see something too and turns on the lights to see better, causing the ball to shut down. Why does everybody keep doing that? Stan starts to get angry that he almost fell for what he believes to be Garside's latest scam and takes the ball and threatens to smash it if Garside doesn't promise to never use it again. That escalated fast. As soon as he leaves, however, Garside just can't help himself and looks into the crystal ball once more. He sees the same image again, Genie approaching a mystery man. The mystery man finally turns around and Garside sees his face. But it's not Stan, it's Brooks the Lone Shark. What, what, what? Garside is stunned and sings the fast-paced patter song, Dr. Freud. 
Dr. Freud, Dr. Freud, doctor, please don't be annoyed, but I really saw a vision, yes I did. Dr. Freud, Dr. Freud, with your teachings I have toyed, now I've got a funny feeling in my head. Does it mean that I'm regressing, or perhaps I'm retrogressing? Do I sound a nitsy bitsy idiotic? How can I dispel a vision when it isn't television? Does it mean I'm going skitsy or psychotic? Back on the boardwalk, Jeannie commiserates with Ma Maloney and asks her if Garside was right. Ma, being a real straight shooter, says, yeah, he is. You're a schlub and you're always running away from your problems. Ouch. But Ma says she knows just what she needs. The power of positive thinking, plus some makeup and perfume. Yikes. She sings, think beautiful. Just think beautiful, think pretty and think adorable things. Though you may be deceiving yourself, you will end up believing yourself. Just think beautiful, think lovely and wear invisible wings. Jeannie leaves as Ma spots Brooks coming. It's almost 5 p.m. and the gang wonders where in the world they can come up with $100 to help out Garside. Where are we gonna come up with that kind of scratch? Just then, a bombshell of a woman enters wearing expensive furs and dripping in jewels. They soon realize it's Addie Farowski. Addie was once a spieler for Mom Maloney. She was also apparently quite the promiscuous girl known as Miss Under the Boardwalk 1960. Tramp. She left to get married, but she's back now, and as one character says, I know all little girls grow up, but you exploded. <laughs> Addie says she's made it big, but wanted to remind herself just how big, so she's come to see her old stomping ground again. Ma asks if she's still married, and Addie says she just got done with husband number three, but she's looking for number four. Marriage is a great institution. Yeah, yeah but, but who, who wants, wants to be in an institution? The gang then all sing Addie's at it again. Well, feast your eyes on the merchandise. Just take a look and eat your hearts out. When I aim, boys, it's for big again, boys. Yes, Addie's at it again. After the song, the gang tell Addie she should go see Garside so he can look into his crystal ball and find husband number four for her, and she agrees and goes to his parlor. After Garside and Addie catch up for a bit, she asks him to look into his ball to find someone for her. She says she's got all the money she needs, now she wants happiness. But Garside is still freaked out by what he saw earlier in the ball and doesn't want to do it but Addie says she'll pay him $100 once he delivers the man. So Garside once more looks into the ball. It glows bright red again and he sees the alley. He hears the bells telling him it's five o'clock and he sees Addie and she's with the man. The man turns around and Garside sees that it's Stan. What? But he won't tell Addie who it is. Garside says, no way, that's not your man. But Addie is intrigued and intends on being in the alley at 5 p.m. to meet this mystery man, and then she'll give him his hundred bucks. It's my money and I need it now! Back on the boardwalk, Addie is telling the gang all about what she learned at Garside's, and she notices it's 10 minutes until 5, and she leaves to go freshen up. Garside comes out and tells them he got the hundred dollars, but it's COD. I just love COD. He tells them to get rid of Addie, and if Jeannie shows up, get rid of her too. Just as Stan enters, clearly all freshened up to meet his potential future mate. Garside tries to convince him that the girl he saw him with in the ball is not the right girl for him. She is not the right girl for you. Stan starts to doubt finding love at all, but the gang all tell him he needs faith. Listen, 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 listen. Faith, faith, brother. Faith, faith, brother. You're as old as your count, but this be your young man. It's now almost five o'clock and Brooks enters looking for Garside. Yeah, where are we on the hundred bucks? Officer Milhauser comes on as well and sees Garside's sign advertising his new, not so legal business and goes to find him too. Brooks spots Garside trying to escape out his window and goes for him. Stan tries to stall him, but Brooks shoves him out of the way and Stan knocks into Addie who's returned and they lock eyes. Brooks chases Garside, but bumps into Jeannie, and they lock eyes. The bell then starts to chime five, just as the crystal ball foretold, and the seemingly mismatched couple sing, Can It Be Possible? Are you? Am I?
After the song, Addie and Stan walk off arm in arm in one direction, Jeannie and Brooks go off together the opposite way, and Officer Milhauser arrests the devastated Garside and carts him off to jail. Well, that was only part one. It's a cliffhanger. Intermission! And you know what you do at intermission, right? Please stop saying don't forget to like and subscribe. That's right! You subscribe to this channel! If you haven't done it already, subscribe to this channel now. It would really help me out. If you're finding value in this, it would really help this channel to grow and uh, I can keep making videos. Oh, but sounds like Act 2 is starting, so we better get back to it. Act 2. Let's go! It is two months later and we're back at the boardwalk but the Alley Gang have lost their oomph. Officer Milhauser starts disparaging Coney Island and all the foreign and low-class people who have invaded it. Racism, racism. Then Mom Maloney and the rest of the gang sing the admittedly catchy but horribly racist neighborhood song. They're oozing through the drain pipes, squeezing through the floors. They're sliding down the rain pipes, breaking down the doors. Watch out, look out, scram! Too late, they're in there. Hurry up! No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. no, 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 hell no, 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 I refuse, no, no. At the end of the number, Garside returns after just being released from jail, but the gang is not pleased to see him. He tries to bribe them with ceramic cats he made in occupational therapy, but they still give him the cold shoulder. Turns out Stan and Jeannie have been missing for the whole two months Garside's been away, and the gang all blame Garside and that stupid crystal ball Sam. See, it's your fault. No. Yes, it's your fault. No. Yes, it is. It's not. It's true. Officer Milhauser tells Garside he's in trouble with his parole officer for missing his last two check-ins because no one told him Garside had gone back to jail. So Garside and Officer Milhauser leave. Brooks and Jeannie then enter dressed to the nines. They announce they're throwing a party tonight in Garside's honor. Stan then shows up as well, also looking very spiffy. Well, hello, Mr. Fancy Pants. He is over the moon happy since he and Addie married each other, and Addie is apparently a changed woman and suddenly the perfect housewife. She's not. The gang make comments about how rich Brooks and Stan look, and the duo sing The Affluent Society. Affable members of the Affluent Society. What a comfortable stage in this age of anxiety. Status symbols, go-getters, tastemakers, pace-setters with credit cards and credit letters. Awfully affable, influent members of the affluent society. Afterwards, Garside returns. Both Stan and Brooks rush to tell him how happy they are, and it's all thanks to him. Brooks not only waves the $100 IOU, but gives Garside $500 as a gift. Cha -ching. Stan says he's making Garside a full-time partner in his new business with a secretary and everything. Osaka then brings Garside Sam the crystal ball. He'd put it out as a prize in a shooting gallery, but no one won it. Garside is ecstatic to see his fortune-telling friend when it suddenly glows bright red. Here we go again. Garside, who can seemingly now talk to the ball, says it's a message for Stan. He says he sees a bunch of cats having a meeting about these small outhouse looking things. That's weird. Stan excitedly says that this is the new business he's splitting with Garside. He's bought a bunch of cabanas on a beach in Darien, Connecticut. Stan takes this as a great sign and runs off to tell Addie who's out on the beach. But Sam the Ball isn't done yet. He's now got a vision for Brooks. Garside sees a bunch of thick droplets dropping from the sky. Chubby rain. Tell him why. It's oil. Brooks gets wide-eyed and explained that he was offered a sort of shady deal involving vegetable oil, but promised Jeannie he wouldn't take it. But Brooks figures he can't go against the ball, right? He's right. No, he's not. So he runs off to make the call and says he'll invest some money for Garside too. Garside is on top of the world, but the ball is still glowing red. This time he sees a vision of Addie and wait, he says, it's not vegetable oil, it's suntan oil. and he rushes off to find Brooks and Stan. Out on the beach, a group of lifeguards are doing calisthenics, as you do, when Addie appears. She flirts heavily with all the lifeguards and they have a big dance number together. Stan catches the end of the number and it's clear to Stan and the audience that Addie hasn't actually changed at all. Once a tramp, always a tramp. 
he sings Fickle Finger of Fate. Life is a dirty book that should be censored, my friend. Don't try to steal a look to find out how it will end. The end is clear, my friend. We're puppets tied to a string on the fickle finger of fate. Afterwards, Garcite rushes on to warn Stan, but it's too late. Stan is heartbroken and he says he is absolutely done with women. He leaves, but not before telling Garside to drop dead. Gosh. The set revolves and we're at Joe's Belly Rama, where the party in Garside's honor is in full swing. Jeannie is on cloud nine and she sings the title song, I Had a Ball. And here is a bit of Karen Morrow and the original Broadway cast performing that number on The Ed Sullivan Show. After the number, which has spilled out onto the boardwalk, the guests all go back inside. Garside comes on and hides in the pizza stand as Brooks comes on to find Jeannie. Brooks is frantically looking for any money he can scrounge up and seems to be in a big hurry. He finally confesses to Jeannie that he invested in the vegetable oil deal and it's gone bad, leaving him in the lurch for $200,000. And that's a lot of money, isn't it? He plans on running away to Brazil and taking Jeannie with him. South America? South America. Jeannie, of course, is hurt he went against her behind her back, but says she wants to stay and try to help. She even wonders how much she'd get for her Ferris wheel. But Brooks tells her he already sold it out from under her by forging her name. Not cool, man. Not cool. She is, of course, devastated and livid and kicks him to the curb. After Brooks leaves, Garside enters and tries to console Jeannie. But after Garside tries to set her up once more with Stan, she tells him she's through and to never mention it again. Garside leaves and Jeannie sings Almost. Almost means never. We're so far apart. I love to think we almost. Later on, we're in Garside's parlor when a very angry Addie storms in. She chucks the crystal ball out the window, but Garside is too depressed to care. She tells him that Stan left her before she could leave him, and that Stan didn't take a nickel of her money. Brooks then enters, also to yell at Garside. He has the crystal ball in his hands, which she said almost killed him. <laughs> he goes to punch Garside in the mouth, but Addie tells him it was she who threw it out the window and slaps Brooks. Brooks then slaps her back. It's of course love at first fight. They sing You Deserve Me. I'm no gentle, sentimental sap. I slap. Well, my pet, you finally met your match. I scratch. After the happy new couple leave arm in arm, Sam, the crystal ball, glows red yet again. This time he sees Stan and Jeannie as Romeo and Juliet happy together on a warm, sunny Labor Day. Garside is overjoyed and sings a reprise of You Deserve Me to Sam the Ball. Your prognostication plus my sly manipulation, we go together, Sam. Let's glow together, Sam. The next scene takes us to Labor Day at the alley, but it's not sunny and warm, it's a rainy day. Stan enters hawking cheap silk ties. Garside comes on and tries to tell him about what the ball saw for him, but he doesn't want to listen and goes off. Jeannie enters and she's hawking these dancing dolls, but she's no good at it. She's bad. And she sucks. The gang all try to ask her why she's selling dolls, but before she can finish telling them about how she lost her Ferris wheel, we hear a police whistle and Stan dashes on and hides. Officer Milhauser runs on and the gang sent him in the wrong direction. 
Garside tries to tell Jeannie about the new prediction, but she's not interested and goes back to selling her dolls. Officer Milhauser comes back and asks to see Jeannie's peddling license, which of course she doesn't have, and so she kicks him in the shins and runs away. Garside does his best to block the cop, but he gets by and gives chase. Stan runs back on and the gang tell him to hide in the Tunnel of Love. Jeannie runs on and guess where she runs to? The Tunnel of Love, indubitably. Officer Milhauser chases her into the Tunnel of Love and Garside follows. The stage revolves and we are now inside the Tunnel of Love. Inside it's covered with spooky bats and skeletons and all these horror tableaus like Jack the Ripper and Frankenstein's monster using mannequins which seems to me really odd for a tunnel of love, but I guess maybe the point is to get scared into each other's arms, maybe? I don't know. Oh, the tunnel of love. Nothing gets a woman in your arms faster than scary robots and simulated privacy. There's then this big, big sequence with Genie, Stan, Garside, and the cop all ducking into different hiding spots while the stage rotates and comic hijinks ensue. Finally, the death scene from Romeo and Juliet rotates by. Stan and Jeannie both get the same idea and take the mannequin's clothes and put them on and pretend to be the mannequins. The stage continues to rotate and Officer Milhauser thinks he's found Stan and Jeannie, but as he grab what turns out to be a dummy, the arm falls off and Milhauser faints. Everyone exits back onto the alley and Stan and Jeannie start arguing. Garside tries to stop them and tell them they are destined to be together. What's the matter with you? <laughs> don't you two see that you're in love with each other? but they both laugh at him. Officer Milhauser has come to and chases after the couple. They try to run in opposite directions, but Milhauser has already cuffed them together and they get jerked back into each other's arms. The sun then comes out and shines bright and warm. Jeannie and Stan seem to be falling in love and as they are carted off to jail holding hands, Garside and the gang sing a reprise of Fickle Finger of Fate. The end. <laughs> Well, what'd y'all think of I Had a Ball? Did you have a ball? Uh, not particularly. When the musical premiered in its out-of-town tryouts in Detroit, the reviews were very encouraging. But New York critics saw the show for what it was, a clown show. People seem to like the clowns. In the 1930s and 40s, popular comics would often leave musicals with very slight books, which were no more than an excuse to get the comic from one silly song or scenario to another. These shows were strictly for laughs. I love to laugh. But after the Rodgers and Hammerstein II sort of artistic revolution in the mid 40s, those types of shows fell out of fashion, or at least had to be very well constructed, like uh, Little Me, for example. I Had a Ball was certainly not up to the standard people were seeing on Broadway at the time, like Hello Dolly, Funny Girl, and Fiddler on the Roof. But still, Hackett was a master clown and got great notices from the critics, despite not being a particularly good singer. That's pretty bad. In fact, in an interview, he made this statement about his singing. Well, maybe it comes off well, but uh, you know, if I wasn't Buddy Hackett and I didn't get all the laughs that I get, the uh, rest of the time, I don't think anybody would accept the singing, except, you know, they would throw harpoons at me and things like that. The rest of the cast, including belly dancer Baracko, got some great notices as well, as did the choreography. But it seemed most agreed there was really only one big reason to see the show. As the headline of John McLean's review in the New York Journal American stated, Buddy Hackett and that's all. Fuck my drag, right? Buddy Hackett in his contract did have first refusal rights to do a movie version of the musical and stated he intended to produce one with his friend Stanley Kramer who'd produced several classic films, but obviously that never came to be. Oh, that's too bad. Hackett was eager to improvise and add his own jokes and little bits as early as the out of town tryout, but by the time the show was opened and running, Hackett's clowning got a tad out of control. Reportedly at one performance, he did 10 minutes of stand-up right in the middle of his opening scene. I Had a Ball closed on June 12th, 1965, after only 199 performances. It's one for the books.
I hope you all had a ball watching this video. Thank you so much for sticking to the end. Again, if you enjoyed it and found some value in it, I would be forever grateful if you'd give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. It really, really does help me make these videos. And don't forget to share this video with the grifter in your life. Thank you all so much for watching. This is Broadway by Ghostlight. I'm Mark Benani. I'll see y'all next time.